Hello, Jack here, welcoming you to I Don't Speak German, episode 112. This is just a little introductory note to explain what's going on. This was originally recorded as a Patreon backer bonus episode, but when we re-listened to it, we decided that it would be appropriate to release it as a mainline episode for everybody, especially given the fact that as I sat down to edit it, the news came through that the Supreme Court in the United States had struck down Roe v. Wade. This episode isn't specifically about Roe v. Wade or the issues about it, but we feel, nonetheless, that this is relevant. We hope you enjoy it and get something out of it. Take care, everybody. This is I Don't Speak German. <laughs> I'm Jack Graham, he him, and in this podcast I talk to my friend Daniel Harper, also he him, who spent years tracking the far right in their safe spaces. In this show we talk about them, and about the wider reactionary forces feeding them and feeding off them. Be warned, this is difficult subject matter. Content warnings always apply. This is bonus well, 17, I think. Bonus 17. I'll take your word for it. Bonus 17. There it is. That's a fact. And uh, this yeah. is just for you, paying customers. Thank you so much for your <laughs> until, money. Until we release it six months later. But yeah, sure. <laughs> until we release it. Yeah. We just um, we just uh, gave the, uh, the non-payers downfall, which you had ages ago. So, you know, it's not just yours anymore, but you had it all to yourself for a long time. So I think that's good yeah. enough, you ungrateful bastards it, um, it's it's for the paying customers because that's how i think of the audience is just customers right you know yeah that's um, right. i i monetize that's that's when we monetize so heavily the things that we do um but it's, <laughs> it's not only for the playing paying customers but also uh you know for for the rabble for the for for the uh, the untamed masses to suddenly get to yeah. absorb you know that's yeah. right the unwashed yeah. peons yeah. Yeah. yeah um so every now and again when i'm feeling depressed i go and look at our uh, look at comments you know on our podcast <laughs> on various platforms you know stitcher and spotify and so on and i and i look down and and that you know there's all the usual ones like you know oh that british guy is really smug and um S sjw cucks and uh groomers and, and and all that sort of usual stuff um Oh, and and the uh, uh, um uh, uh, um uh, stuff that that lots of that, people that, hate us that's, for that. Which that's only on my end, just to be clear. <laughs> that's not true. Uh, but there there was one I saw. I can't remember where it was, but there was one I saw where they said, um, "Oh, it's all paywall now." I think what? No, it's not. What the fuck is that even? Like, I don't read the reviews because I couldn't do this work and do the re and read the reviews. Like, you know, I yeah. kind of have to have a certain amount of just independence and confidence in terms of like my ability to understand what's going on. Um, not that I don't care what people want to hear and not that I don't care what people are saying, but I just can't. I just, I know my creative process just will not allow me to absorb that, at least for this project. But, <laughs> It's all paywall now is like the wrongest, like it's the, all the important shit is free, you know, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Yeah. That's why it made me laugh, you know, cause it's completely bass backwards and yeah. I couldn't tell if it was coming from the right or the left. Cause it could have been like some, uh, very idealistic young anarchist who was outraged by the fact that we now have Patreon only episodes, you know, yeah. and sort of somehow got themselves worked up to think, oh, it's all it's it's all behind a paywall now. The sellouts, capitalist sellouts, <laughs> or it could have been from the right, you know, just lying. That's yeah. what I like about it. It's, it's a sort literally, of it's literally give, comment. It's only give one or the other of us a dollar a month, which is the minimum amount that Patreon allows you to give. You know, yeah. and you get it's access to paywall. the full catalog there. I mean, it's a paywall. Like, I, I hate that we have this, but it actually does like increase the subscribers by just giving yeah. people anything at all, you know, and um, like if that works, then that's fine. But like literally, if you're, you know, 
I, I I shouldn't say this as a, like a good capitalist or whatever. I'm not a good capitalist, but I shouldn't say this. But like, look, if you literally can't afford a dollar a month, I will send you the episodes. It's fine. Like, you know, like it doesn't matter to me. You know, I would rather you listen and get enjoyment out of it and spread it than otherwise. But it actually does. Like when we did start doing paywall episodes, like I think both of our patrons went up by, you know, 20% or whatever. And that, you know, mm-hmm. considering yeah. that this is a, a good percentage of our income, that makes a difference. Uh, you know, the, the most boring thing for any Patreon subscriber is listening to us talk about our Patreon subscribers. But, you know, like it is, it is like we, we you know, like, I don't know, like that's just ridiculous to me. Um, it's silly. Uh, but I liked it anyway. Yeah. No. But yeah. Yeah. It's funny. So, um, it's funny. So, so, so here you, yeah. Here, here you are behind the paywall. Uh, yeah, uh, where listeners. we continually um, just talk about like movies from the nineties because yes. this, the Patreon <laughs> is now Daniel and Jack relitigate the nineties American mm-hmm. cinema. Um, which uh, I could do this forever, but I feel like maybe we should move away from it for the next episode, just to be clear, um, and and yeah. try to move on yeah. into something else. But uh, we have been talking a lot about. 90s movies and we're doing that again and we're talking about uh well we're both 90s kids you know it's yeah. and and m- most people doing podcasts are white men of roughly our age who were yeah. 90s kids and they do talk about 90s movies so our our paywalled bonus backer only episodes are just like every other podcast on the end inter- except of course that they're done by us so they're better yeah yeah no no it's clearly clearly <laughs> did you listen to the uh to Ina's after show part uh episode number two by chance uh was that the i, I listened to the one with andy kindler Andy Kindler was the first one, and then the second one was uh, it was uh, two two young women who were uh, patrons of hers. Who I haven't uh, gone to that yet. Yeah, well, they had very nice things to say about us for about forty five seconds, and so uh, oh. yeah. Well, the, I'd, I'd love to seek that out because it's re- very rare that a woman of any age, let alone a young woman, <laughs> says anything nice about me. So I, I must hear this. <laughs> I, I won't say young. I, maybe I said young earlier, but uh, very lovely, very young, very lovely people who uh, were intelligent and insightful and then also uh, kind of really stuck their foot in the mud by giving us praise. But yeah, other than that, it was fine. Other than that, it yeah. was brilliant yeah. commentary. So yeah, go, <laughs> go subscribe. Yeah. And go subscribe to Ida's, until uh, they said we were good. Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Cause I awesome. Yep. Anyway, primary colors. Yeah. That's what we're here to Prim- talk about. Primary, yeah. <laughs> or, or should I say primary colors because of the the inaccurate way you Americans spell things? Yeah, well, um, yeah. yeah. I was going to have a... Butcher the yeah, Queen's uh, English. Yeah, well, that's what we do. We, you know, it's it's just ultimately, you know, we just we just butcher everything, you know, uh, mm. particularly language. Um, so, yeah, primary colors, 1998, uh, which is effectively... Uh, 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 a romantic clef uh, about the Clinton presidency. The film is directed by the legendary Mike Nichols, written by the legendary Elaine May, and it's based upon the novel Primary Colors, which was published anonymously originally, uh, yeah. and it turned out, and I think, I think a lot of people knew right from the start, although it was, he denied it, but it turned out to have been written by Joe Klein, didn't it? Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he admitted it, you know, a, a few months later or whatever, you know, like, um, but yeah, it was published in 96. The book was um, mm-hmm. during this sort of like 1996, you know, presidential election and uh, Bill Clinton's reelection. Um, but it is about, uh, you know, sort of, you know, <laughs> the, you know, the veiled story of the, like the real insider story of the 1992 um, Bill Clinton campaign. Um, during the uh, primaries, during the Democratic primaries, and um, yeah, you see, th- yeah. this is the thing because I, I, so I was aware of this, but I'd never really, I'd never read it or seen the film until you suggested doing it for this. So li- li- I saw the film for the first time, literally a couple of days ago, um, and I, I. I sort of had it in my head that it was written by PJ O'Rourke somehow. I don't know how I got that idea. Um, and that, that I, is, that I is did. a completely reasonable assumption. And if you don't know who PJ O'Rourke is, um, um, go back, back to you. your TikTok, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, no, just count your blessings in life. <laughs> True. Count your blessings and enjoy the fact that you are not an old man like Jack at my IR. but yes, yes. you probably, 
probably don't even know who George Will is either, you lucky <laughs> bastards. Um, the yeah. fact that there were like SNL segments making fun of George Will talking about baseball is the most hilarious. Like, it is the most esoteric thing. Like, how do you even explain that to someone who's 25 in 2022? I know. You just yeah. can't. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's like trying to explain, I don't know, winding a cassette tape with a pencil you know they don't know what either of those things are so they have no frame <laughs> of reference blowing in the nes tape that's the uh, you know the, the equivalent yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah no i had a i had a sort of vague idea of what this was so i had a vague notion that it had been written by pj o'rourke and i didn't realize that it was f- as fictionalized as it as it is i thought it was actually like a, a faction novel, if you know what I mean, a bit like yeah. Schindler's Ark by um, um, Thomas Keneally, where it's it's told like an or um, uh, in Cold Blood, of course, uh, by uh, Truman Capote, where it's told like a novel in the style of a novel, but all all the names are are the real names and the facts, are, you know. So I thought it was like I thought I thought it was actually about the Clintons directly. So right, yeah, yeah. When I finally watched the movie. Um, I was a little bit surprised. I was like, who's this Stanton guy? I don't, who, who's this? It confused me deeply. I, I, it foxed me. I couldn't work this out. I couldn't work out what was happening. Um, not even after John Travolta opened his mouth <laughs> <laughs> and did his, his Bill Clinton impression. I was still confused. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I think uh, we were talking about this in, in one, of our, one of our group chats and it was like a, yeah, this is still probably one of John Travolta's great roles, which kind of speaks to John Travolta's career in some ways, um, you know, mm. which I'm not kind to John Travolta. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a thing when he's good. He's good. And he's uh, good in like at least four places here, I think. So, you know, yeah, no, this is not like a in any sense a sort of like direct retelling of the clinton primaries it's more Mm -hmm. a sort of taking the general concept of a person like bill clinton and sort of like retelling it in this kind of insidery way and that Mm -hmm. was kind of the big story because what i remember is like i was 12 years old in 1992 and i remember kind of like following the presidential primaries in 1992 as a 12 year old through like <laughs> reading time magazine you know where joe and Klein that's is, how you grow up to be a podcast host and kids. that's and that's actually the, the when we talk about the origin story of i don't speak german when you talk about the daniel harper origin story that's a really big piece like in that you know my first memories politically were following the 1992 campaign and being uh-huh. a giant at again at 12 years old ross perot supporter um one day which is sh- about the only the only age at which that's you know forgivable no 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 that, that completely forgivable at 12 years old he had graphs you understand clearly he knew things um you know well, he was a he was a novelty wasn't he he yeah, was just well, he wasn't he, yeah <laughs> and Shiny and this and the shame is, and the shame is that like Sam Harris uses that same uh, political philosophy in 2022 at 60 or whatever Sam Harris is, is like, there are numbers. This person produces numbers and therefore must be a uh, political, uh, political genius. No, that's not actually how it works. Uh, we could also scientific uh, talk about, data can't be racist. Could also talk about Nate Silver uh, if we wanted to to get into that. But we have other things to talk about, namely uh, primary color. So anyway, um, yeah. this was a huge story in 1996 when, you know, four years later, when the book came out, it was also like heavily <laughs> talked about in those circles. And I was still kind of reading, you know, those kind of political magazines. There was no internet. I mean, the internet existed at that point, but there was no like political internet in the way that we know it now. And so like everything kind of comes down to like, just kind of reading uh, magazines and newspapers, which I was doing pretty regularly when I was a teenager at that point. And um, this was like a huge, like bit of buzz, you know, it's like, who wrote this, who did this? This is like this big insidery account. It has like a whole bunch of like juicy details. And I was going to read the book. I read about a third of the book just to sort of compare it to the movie it tracks the movie very closely and at least it's first third. So maybe like after that, it kind of like veers off, but um, 
<laughs> just taking the movie as sort of a, an accurate representation, which may be unfair, but um, this has absolutely nothing to do with the 1992 primaries, <laughs> to be clear, um, <laughs> beyond the fact that there is a governor of a southern state with, uh, you know, an uh, intellectually uh, uh, pedigreed wife who uh and, and he's fooling around and she's kind of trying to exert some influence on the campaign and uh some of the kind of individual figures are very kind of accurate to real life but you know once you get past like the first third of the movie like none of this has any you know real like none of the like political things in it um have any have any kind of real uh valence to the real world um beyond like this very superficial level and so um i guess just to just to bring it back to the movie and to try to keep this podcast episode to a manageable length um uh and not to not to not to force you into a certain into guide rails um what did you think of the film kind of like like what are your general thoughts like you just uh, i thought you had obviously seen this but the fact that you hadn't until two days ago kind of fascinates me like what what are your thoughts you know on the film like kind of as a film or kind of however you want to go i just i'm just curious like what's your kind of like two minute like thoughts on the film okay well the first thing is of course uh, relevant to what we've been talking about a little bit already is just i was watching this and despite the fact that i've never seen it before watching it to watch it for me was to just experience this gigantic rush of nostalgia you know because it's just it is it is so 90s it looks even down to the film stock and the it, everything it's just so and of course it is because that's when it was made everything bears yeah. the the stamp of its time you know but this this is just just that particular just film then had a the kind of film that they used in studio pictures then had a particular kind of feel and a particular kind of look and the the color grading and the grain of the film and everything just conspired to make just you know because i was i was 16 in 1992 you know the 90s were like my teenage years so i mean this was released in 98 you said so yeah that that's that's the that's the point in time when I was turning into a young man and I was getting into you know I was watching a huge amount of movies then more than I more than I do now, so it was just this kind of, it was like being bashed in the face with nostalgia for youth you know, um, and I'm not actually somebody who's usually given to that sort of thing like I'm not I'm not one of these people that sits around thinking oh the days of my youth I couldn't give a fuck basically, um, but it is. Um, yeah, it was kind of wow. Even it, I think maybe even more so because I'd never seen it before. Like it should have. It, it didn't really happen when I watched The Fugitive for our last bonus episode. Sure. And I think just even though The Fugitive is just an incredibly '90s movie as well. And of course, on some level, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, "Oh yeah, the '90s. Yeah, that's what it looked like, the '90s." But it wasn't. Whereas this, as I say, I'm watching it for the first time. So to me, it's a new movie. But it's. It's like, you know, I suppose it felt like watching a new movie in 1998, if you know what I mean. So it yeah, kind of no. affected me more. Yeah. Well, I feel like I feel like Primary Colors has this like it's this weird time capsule in which we just don't make movies like that anymore, at least for yeah. the big screen. Um, yeah. And kind of what happened after uh, after 2000 is like sort of the HBO. Yeah. All this stuff's on television now. Anything yeah, like that the, is just on TV now. It's well, not HB, HBO literally makes like, you know, a few years later of some political event. They make like Game Change, I think it was 2004 or something. And that's like HBO retelling the story of the Sarah Palin selection as the vice presidential candidate for John McCain. Mm -hmm. And this is all mm -hmm. like very kind of like taken directly from headlines at the time and taken from like direct journalistic accounts. And, you know, in this like very sort of like straightforward way telling that story. Um, and they've just kind of like, and regardless of how you feel about those films, which I think, you know, they're, if Jack wants to do a side podcast, just talking about HBO films about American electoralism, I'm game. <laughs> like if anyone wants to do that, I would absolutely do that. I am fascinated by it probably because I was 12 years old and following the democratic primaries. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, I am yeah. fascinated by American presidential politics. I find it like 
enormously entertaining um it's sick it's a sick fascination for me um you should treat that with no more reverence than you would if i said i was really (laughs) really interested in and redacted terrible thing you know i'm not even going to tell the joke of like what the terrible thing is just name your terrible thing you know like i make uh work warhammer 4k miniatures out of cat shit like that would be, you know, equal to following American electoral politics, you know, um, on the presidential level. Anyway, uh, but uh, you know, I find that uh, the you know that those movies have kind of like taken some of the air out of this sort of thing because, like, honestly, like those because they're produced for HBO for a paying you know subscriber base can just sort of like get to the brass tacks. They're not like interested in appealing to like the widest possible audience that any like kind of big hollywood production has to and so and they can be made on you know kind of shorter time frames and uh, ultimately um you know it kind of you know comparing one of those to primary colors primary colors is constantly kind of like pulling its punches like there's no real political valence to this in like an explicit way is is something that i find interesting and sort of like revisiting it because when i saw this i would have seen this a, probably on a page cable channel in like 2000 or 2002 or something you know around that time period um i did not see this theatrically i would have caught it you know just on tv late at night it would have been something that just came on and i watched um and uh at the time, it felt like it's this sort of like really um, interesting conversation around, um, you know, how do we feel about someone who is like flawed on a personal level, but maybe has like, you know, kind of like this kind of like profound political ability and, you know, this kind of like policy wonkishness, which is what the movie wants you to feel about it ultimately, and which I kind of fell for pretty readily because i think there's a there's a real um filmmaking prowess at at stake here i mean there's this uh kind of i think a great i mean great moment in the film you know in terms of you know in terms of its directorial style and writing etc you know uh in which we uh we have been on the inside of this like campaign argument um, and then our lead, which we haven't even talked about the characters in the movie, but our lead, Henry Burton, um, stares out the window to a Krispy Kreme, which is lit in this like almost like, <laughs> you know, like film noir style in this like very like neon lights everywhere. Well, and then we at the end of, of that sequence, it directly references uh, Hopper's painting Nighthawks as yeah. every movie representation of people at night in a bar has to do by law. Right. I'm, I'm given to understand. And, and we learned that, uh, that Jack Stanton, who should have by all rights been inside arguing about political maneuvering. is actually sitting and having just, a really good conversation with this man who run who is working in the late night shift at the donut shop who mm-hmm. works his ass off you understand who is works who works like every day hours a day and who you know and and i do not say this lightly but is clearly something that's implied by the film has mental disabilities like uh, that's that's clearly indicated by the film um but he doesn't mind it because he just wants to work and jack stanton he's just sitting there having a nice conversation with this guy instead of being involved in the deeper political discussions of the people outside of this and this is portrayed as jack stanton being this like uh exquisite man who deserves to be the president of the united states i i don't know am i over am i overestimating am i overstating the quality of this sequence you know in terms of what it's really trying to say about stanton i don't think so i mean in either meaning of the word quality it's very well that wonderful pan out of the window slow pan towards yeah. the crispy cream and the way the 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 um the sound mix gradually changes so that the sounds of the people in the room arguing gradually are superseded by the the distant sound of stanton in the crispy cream chatting with the guy behind the counter etc until suddenly you know off off camera obviously round the back of the camera so to speak henry walks into the crispy cream having obviously abandoned the uh, yeah it's really well done and the other and in the other sense quality um I think your I think your description of what the film is trying to put across about Stanton is 
absolutely correct. Yeah, I think that's what it's getting at. I think it's getting at the the idea that he's kind of maybe a bit selfish and and even feckless, you know, because he's kind of abandoned the people in the room to do the work for him. But at the same time, there's a there's a guy with a with a genuine concern and a genuine warmth for uh, working people uh, there, you know. I, right. I think I think that is what the film is trying to say. Yeah, yeah, and and, and like in the loop, it has this sort of. Um you know, it has this sort of uh, which we discussed in our previous episode. Uh, so go back and look in the archives. Um, but like in the loop, it has this sort of like appearance of a you know, sort of a, a like a wise uh, um, cynicism. Right. In terms of like mm. looking at, mm. you know, uh, we are political professionals. Right. We come in, we work for a candidate. Uh, some of them we believe in, some of them we don't. But we do this. We, we, we have a certain set of skills we bring to this thing. And when we lose, we lose. And when we win, we win. And ultimately, we just move on to the next guy because that's what our job is. Um, but then they then believe like Stanton is the real thing uh, and you know stanton and and let's not I mean, stanton is clinton like like there's no there's really no distance between them in terms of like what the character of this person is supposed to be um in terms of the film i mean travolta is doing a clinton impersonation now i think there yeah. are places where that gets a little bit more interesting and complicated in terms of some of the like like childlike responses for instance when he you know walks into that like you know cheap hotel room that first time and he just starts like you know fumbling with the blinds and doing that sort of thing um this is not something that we've ever seen you know like you know this does not like i this is not speak to the sort of like the persona of bill clinton as we've seen him like portrayed in other reporting right so this feels like this kind of like something that maybe kind of comes from a, a more authentic uh you know kind of actor's place in terms of travolta trying to find the character um but you know ultimately that is very thin gruel in terms of trying to pretend that stanton is not clinton you know this is this is <laughs> this is very much bill clinton you know um the the interesting the interesting thing to me about this film is how little actual politics there is in it in terms yeah. of content you know it's all it's all just process yeah um and that we are repeatedly told or or at least we are repeatedly invited to watch characters who who apparently believe what they're saying talk about stanton as you know something different this guy means it this guy's for real this guy you know and that that seems to really be the entirety of his politics at least as far as the people around him are concerned you know the his his great sort of inspirational political meaning as a figure and his program and his ideology and, and his policies and everything seems to just boil down to no he he actually cares about people um, <laughs> right. and it's it's amazing how how resistant that perception is on the part of the characters to evidence like henry is shown repeatedly that that's not true i mean he it's literally in the, it's literally in like it. the third scene in the movie right yeah 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 so not it's to, the not uncle to, charlie thing or whatever not it was, to, yeah it? no no it's, it's the henry? uncle charlie thing not to not to interrupt yeah. but like yeah totally Please. so uh the the first thing that we kind of like are presented with is Jack Stanton is doing this like politically useless um, like conversation. He's doing this like uh, sort of sort of like a meeting with this uh, group of adult uh, literacy people, you know. So it's a bunch of people who are learning how to read in this like kind of big like uh, in this library, right? Um, and it's this tiny program. It has no like political advantage. There's no like media present. Um, it's dead in the water. Like, why would any person trying to run for president do this? And uh, we're told by the like wizened like political guy um speaking to our our kind of our viewpoint character uh, henry burton who is a stand-in for george stephanopoulos and uh just as an aside if you notice Sorry. that henry burton as a character is uh the grandson of a black radical from the 60s who yeah. has worked within like African American campaigns um, and who has become disaffected from losing all the time. Um, 
is not exactly the life story of George Stephanopoulos and was not even in 1998. Um you have so, put a so pinpoint Henry, in, yeah. Henry is supposed to be the stand-in for George Stephanopoulos. Yes, uh, that is no, that is. Yeah, I no, don't. He, I don't see that at all. I don't. No, see no, no. That it's it's a complete. This this is. I mean, and this is like this kind of fundamental twisting of reality that we see in which, like, our viewpoint character is like in this. I mean, you know, like. On paper, at least, this sort of like kind of morally um, above it all kind of guy who has uh, a real like pedigree in terms of his father and grandfather are, you know, he has worked in these kind of political campaigns. He has worked for years in doing this. And now he's just looking for somebody who's going to get shit done. And Stanton fulfills that, but also fulfills this like he believes it. He believes in everything that we do, but he lies about it in order to get elected. You know, like that's sort of the the message that we hear from from um, Burton about Stanton. That's pretty yeah, much that's, in the dialogue at one that's point. Text, yeah. That's text in the movie. And uh, God, we could go through this scene by scene. We are not going to do that, of course, because <laughs> I'm not prepared to do that. But like I like I watched this three times for this podcast and I found bullshit everywhere it's <laughs> everywhere um you know and i still quite like the movie that's the thing like i'm like yeah no it's a fun movie go watch it you know just turn just don't think about 1992 ever you know <laughs> in, in response um but yeah no um no henry burton in terms of his sort of like uh placement within this campaign he he holds the role of George Stephanopoulos. And why would Joe Klein choose well, to put choose to change the characteristics of George Stephanopoulos to this uh, degree? Well, well, yeah. well, this tells you just how much bullshit is actually involved in terms of this narrative. Right. Um, and the book just kind of like follows along for that. Um, so, yeah, no, that, that's a very uh, kind of clear thing that's been changed that's one of and, and basically again everything after like the first third has no like you know all the maneuvering and that sort of like last two thirds of it it has no like direct counterpart in fact even if you look at like the um the wikipedia page for the novel you know it's like you know well uh you know who is freddie picker you know who does yeah. he represent and it's like well yeah. it's jerry brown and ruben askew and Harold Hughes and, and Ross Perot. It's all four of these guys in one character. And it's like, no, it's not, there's no, there's no comparison there. Like that's not, that's not what this is, you know? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's one of many questions that I, you know, I sort of, I, I know, I know you little, you know more about this than I do. So I do have sort of, I have lots of headings here with question marks next to them, you know, <laughs> like, right. um, uh, you know, heart attack after phone in debate, question mark. No, no, none of this is real. None of this is real. None of no, real. no, I didn't think so. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, no, I've got is... um, I've got Hagman. Uh, by, by the way, brilliant performance. It just goes yeah. to show what a, what no, a fine actor I mean, Larry Hagman ph was. Phenomenal. Um, I mean, it's phenomenal all the way down. When like Tony Shalhoub is like number thirty on your cast list. I mean, even yeah. in nineteen ninety eight, that that's a that's a really strong cast. Like, although yeah. he's playing like you know cuban immigrant and you know when, yeah um yeah that that it was probably a little bit more believable when we didn't know tony shalhoub and who he was <laughs> you know it's a great performance but you know it's a thing, he's always so. great yeah. yeah but no i mean I've, I've got this like you know hagman uh great performance uh who is picker question mark question mark question mark um can i can i can i ask I sure, mean, go ahead. I yeah. kind of assumed that the Billy Bob Thornton character is supposed to be James Carville. Is oh, that yeah. right? No, it's very yeah. James Carville. Like now, to my knowledge, there is no allegation that James Carville ever pulled his dick out to a lesbian that staffer. Was another um, question. Yeah. Yeah. And to my knowledge, <laughs> there's no there's no uh there's no indication that that happened. But like and I apologize. I mean, look, we're in the we're in the presence of friends here on our Patreon subscribers. You know, um, uh, I don't like to use this kind of language, but James Carville 
you know, when the allegations against when like, you know, Jennifer Flowers came out um, and mm-hmm. like accused him of of sexual assault or at least sexual impropriety, however you want to, def- you know, look, like, I'm not here to relitigate that. You know, we're not we're not here for that. Um, but uh, when that stuff comes out, um, James Carville's like thing, like his line that he would literally go on like CNN and say is, you know, the Republicans are just drawing a hundred dollar bill on a string through a trailer park and bringing up like every fucking floozy who yeah. would say a bad word about the perfect man, Bill Clinton. And, you know, if you're a political, I mean, and this is, you know, look, if you're in electoral politics and your job is to get your guy elected, this is what you do. This is the reality of your job. Like, it's not even like, I mean, it is a moral question because that is despicable, of course, but, you know, it's built into the system. Ultimately, this is what electoral politics is about, you know, is, well, our guy is going to be better than the other guy. And therefore, you know, we just smear, we just smear these women, regardless of the quality of what they're having to say with this thing in the media, because ultimately we're powerful and they're not. That's the, and that's what you do. And that's what a political operative is just going to do for their candidate, period. Um, you know, you know, Stephanopoulos is up to that, uh, up to his neck in that as well. Like, you know, Carville is a fucking lowlife, but Stephanopoulos is supposed to have referred to Jennifer Flowers as um, the, the our first bimbo avalanche yeah. or bimbo sure. apocalypse yeah. or something like that. Or, yeah. And the, the the sort of the the, the way I mean, it, as you say, we're not going to. Relitigate the whole sort of Clinton we sex could, scandal we, thing. I but, would, I would be happy to discuss this in another place when I've done my yeah. research on this. You know, yeah, and uh, sure. oh, by the but, way, just um, I'm just going to put this here. Juanita Bod- Broderick was almost certainly raped by Bill Clinton. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the evidence. Paula is Jones kind of was almost certainly sexually assaulted by Bill Clinton. Mm-hmm. And- yeah, I mean. I, I would draw, I would say, like, look, even if you're a powerful political figure, there is at least an argument to be said for, you know, um, consensual adult relationships, you know, um, and I think there are some of these relationships that feel that, you know, to me, uh, but there are others that, you know, yeah, no, I think Juanita Broderick was in 1978, like when he was governor of Arkansas, um, I, it, it's despicable, despicable behavior. I, um, yeah, I, I agree. Know. Yeah. And, and it's a. It, it's an it's an irony, isn't it, that um, the the scumbag David Brock for the American Spectator, I think it was the, the yeah. far right uh, magazine. He was the muckraker for. He, you know, he he's the one that launches that uh, leads the assault against Anita Hill um, when she alleges uh, very credibly alleges sexual harassment from Clarence Thomas, who's in the news at the moment. Um, <laughs> who could have seen that coming? Because but, the nineties you know, have never ended. Ultimately, never yep. ended. Yeah, yep. um, a, li- a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty is his line. Pardon me, but that's uh, the way he he um, traduced Anita Hill. And uh, you know, he I've read his book where he sort of recants his work for the right wing smear machine blinded in the 90s by the right and, blinded by yeah. the right i read that yeah. i read that in the 2000s for yeah, again yeah. 20 years but of ago, course but the, the, for sure yeah it would be it would be lovely to accept his his uh, you know damascene conversion but david brock just became a scumbag for the other side so david brock is just yeah. sort of obviously on some sort of existential innate level he's just a piece of shit but yeah he well, ironically well, but, enough, and i, I want to put a pin on this just just to be clear like the movie argues that like being a piece of shit for the right side it's actually fine right like that's what the movie is kind of ultimately arguing in some uh, kind of larger sense don't you think it's ambivalent about that i i, I think it's pretty ambivalent about that. i, I think when like, you end your movie with um uh, henry burton standing there shaking the hand of uh, jack stanton having just been elected president of the united states in this like respectful way after knowing everything he knows, I think that like, yeah, he made it's ambivalent in the sense of like, it thinks it's kind of icky to do that, but I think it ultimately supports the kind of overall like perspective. It's like, yeah, no, that's, you know, that's interesting. 
Stanton, Stanton gets the big Stanton gets the big speech is like, you know, like, look, Lincoln did this. FDR did this. All the great heroes. Kennedy did this. All the all the all the great liberal heroes that and liberal heroes is a you know, look, we don't have to talk mm. about that. But like all of the people that you respect, all the people who did great things in American history uh, within this realm did a whole bunch of this bullshit. And they had to because that's what they did to get elected. That's what they had to do in order to get things done. And they had results. And that's ultimately the answer, you know, is did you did you end things better than you didn't? Uh, you know, did, did you actually do good with what you did? And ultimately, all the rest is water under the bridge because that's what you're going to be remembered for. And you've helped a whole lot of people. I think that's the argument that the film is ultimately making. But it's kind of like rubbing its hands about it. It's like shifting, it's shifting its feet. It's kind of doing the like, well, we don't feel great about this, but ultimately this is the argument. That, that's how I see what the film is saying. Hmm. That's interesting. Just, just to finish the thought, I was just remarking on the irony that David Brock, the, the muckraker, he actually investigated the Juanita Broderick story and decided that she was lying. So, you know, yeah. on that, you know, misogyny and distrust of, of victims when they speak out is so strong on the right <laughs> that it, it allows David Brock at that point in his life to say, yeah, Clinton probably didn't do this one. Right. So, yeah. Well, um, in the in the irony is in the irony is that like today, I mean, at least in the 2020 cycle, the uh, uh, what was her name? The uh, the accuser against Joe Biden, um, uh, Tara Reid. Tara Reid, that's the one. Sorry, I apologize for not remembering the name. You understand? Um, a yeah, lot of details get lost. Um, yeah, was absolutely was embraced by. Um, the right wing, you know, at the time and not in a way of like, we now believe victims, but in a way of we can use this against our political opponents, you know? Um, and uh, I personally, I think Tara Reid was probably telling at least some version of the truth. Um, I think, I think she was telling her story honestly, and you know, the details get lost over the decades, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, right. if you I, no. if you think Christine Blasey Ford's telling the truth, you should you should think Paula Jones is probably telling the truth, and you should think uh, Tara Reid's probably telling the truth as as as, as they yeah. remember it, you know, yeah. as best they can. No, absolutely. Um, and but also, you know, and this again gets <laughs> maybe maybe this gets cut, but you know, the argument that you got to see um, uh, on Twitter at least, you know, was you know even you know people talking about Tara Tara Reid and talking about you know like. Yeah, it sounds very much like Joe Biden did some terrible shit, um, you know, as a powerful person and uh, assaulted some people and assaulted at least yeah. this one woman. Right. Um, and the answer is, well, well, Donald Trump is worse. And if you believe Tara Reid, you have to believe like a hundred people who have done much, who have said similar things much more terrible about Donald Trump, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, by the same standards of evidence, right? Now, like, this is not to, you know, again, to defend anyone, but to say, well, one versus a hundred, I'll take the one, you know, because we're stuck in the system in which it's either one or the other, right? You know, like, like that's, that's a realistic sort of political calculation in terms of, uh, like, I voted for Joe Biden. I didn't like it. I was not a fan. I live in a swing state. I voted for Joe Biden, um, despite believing that he very likely sexually assaulted Tara Reid, um, because there was no other. I, I believed it was a, a duty of mine, you know, and that's kind of where we end up in in this sort of like morass. Right. You know, um, yeah. 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 And you don't even have to go to, well, I mean, you should, but I'm not saying it's not important, but you don't have to go to things like that to, you know, <laughs> Biden did, <laughs> did Biden do bad things well, in I office, mean, you know? I, and, and I've, and I have been, I have been, I have been on this. I've said this like in various places and I want to be clear about this. This is not me saying that, uh, that a personal sexual assault of Tara Reid is forgivable, to be clear, right? It's despicable, despicable behavior, like the worst thing that any kind of ordinary human being could ever do. But Joe Biden is not an ordinary human being. Joe Biden has real political power and real financial power and real, like, and he has for decades. And what he has done 
to shore up the credit card industry in Delaware huh? and to mm-hmm. protect them from like tax abatements and to you know, allow them to uh, dig their financial claws into Americans all over the, uh, you know, and into like, really people all over the world, but certainly within the United States. Um, far worse than a single, you know, claim of sexual assault, <laughs> you know. I feel terrible even saying that, but I think I hope that people listen to me and hear my words is what they mean. Like the number of sexual assaults that through um, that mechanism Joe Biden has allowed or has engendered is far greater than his like personal terrible sins. You know what I mean? Mm. And I feel like bringing it back to the movie, the movie doesn't understand that at all. Right. The movie, the movie never yeah. gets into this in the slightest. This is you know. exactly what I'm trying to work around to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead. Just, yeah. just on, on the, on the, on the question of Biden personally, like um, think about the amount of sexual assault that takes place in prison and think about the current predicament of the United States, re the prison industrial complex and mass yeah. incarceration. I, you know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's, you know, it's, it's grotesque, you know, as you've, as you've pointed out, yeah. the United yeah, over, States has over, more people incarcerated two- yeah, over two million Americans are incarcerated in prison right now. You know, well, you can Which, trace that right back to Joe Biden and Bill Clinton because the 1994 yeah. Clinton administration Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, you know, it introduces three strikes and stuff like that. It was drawn up for Clinton by Joe Biden, so he's in it. You know, he's he's in that up to his neck. Um, yeah. yeah, and that you know that's they're right there. You know, leaving out. Everything else, like leaving out Clinton gutting Glass Steagall, which sets us up for 2007, 2008, and the Great Crash and the Great Recession, leaving out what the Clinton administration did to Haiti, leaving out what it did to Iraq, leaving out all this stuff. It just, you know, just that by itself, it guts, it just immediately, the slightest bit of actual historical material context just immediately sort of explodes this movie's pontification about, well, okay, he's not a perfect man. He cheats on his wife and uh, and so on and so forth. But, you know, if we get him into office, he might leave the world better than he, he didn't. He didn't, yeah. he manifestly did not. He left the world much worse than he found it as a result of the Clinton's disgusting gutting of welfare in the United States, where they destroy the old New Deal federal welfare program and they set up uh, TANF or TANF in its place. The the disgustingly named Personal Responsibility Act 1996, you know, all the, you know, super predators and welfare queens and all that. There's a direct line between that and and poverty rates in, in the United States skyrocketing. So he can go to, you know, adult literacy classes and and cry, you know, and, and he might even really care. He might even really care about yeah. that guy in the Krispy Kreme. It doesn't matter. He left the world much worse than he found it. So the whole basis of this sort of liberal hand-wringing moral conundrum thing, it's just, it's not there. It's fake. The whole thing is fake from right, right down to the bottom. It's I based mean, on false premises. I mean, if I can be allowed to sort of do the liberal counter argument, like in like I don't believe this, but it, you just just go with me here for a second. Well, you know, a second George Bush Senior term would have been worse, you know, and then like, well, if a Republican had been charged, it would have been worse. Um, yeah, I'm going to respond. Um, I agree. Yes, absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. By any measure, a Republican is worse than a Democrat. But when your uh, when your Democratic hero, when the person that you're relying on to be this, when this is the scope of like the left wing of our electoral politics is what Jack just described, and you know I have another you know half dozen examples I could bring up, but you know there's no reason to do you know like look it's fine you know like yeah terrible terrible things and this was recognized at the time by you know progressive left of center left of the democrat uh you know political groups this was known and this is actually something that's sort of hinted at in primary colors in which you know like um henry burton's girlfriend is sort of gone like yeah stanton stanton oh, is not the best character do, in the film yeah, by a yeah, mile you mean yeah who who literally you know she gets seen in her underwear in like scene four or whatever, you know, um, you know, uh, and he says, yeah, I'll see you in a couple of hours. Be mad at me for a couple of hours and then I'll be back. And then he goes to run off with Stanton and he gets on a plane. And then like the next time we see her is she's asking like, you know, loaded questions about, uh, you know, 
about his Vietnam history, about his, uh, you know, about, you know, maybe he got off easily by making a deal with the mayor of Chicago during the 1968 riots or whatever, you know, because he had an eye towards a political career, which, <laughs> and then she's gone from the movie. She's completely gone. Like yeah. Yeah. she never comes back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she's, then he's, she's exploited uh, for her, her appearance. You yeah. know, the male gaze is, is employed yeah. and she's written according to the angry black woman stereotype, but mm-hmm. she's still by far the best character in the yeah. film because no. she actually has some material politics. I would, I, I would, I would definitely pair this with Bob Roberts, um, which you know oh, yeah. was actually made in 1992. And um, yeah, I, I really want to see uh, her and uh, Gian, Giancarlo Esposito's character you know have a newsletter together um yeah yeah, yeah. and uh louis Stipin's uh, character as well that's the movie i want to see ultimately yeah yeah but you know she she gets left completely out of the movie it's amazing you know really re-watching it as an adult you know, with someone who you know with, with some like degree of sophistication that i didn't have necessarily in my early 20s when i saw this the first time and just noticing just how much like certain things just they show up and they get dropped because like to continue that narrative would be problematic, you know, because if she showed up at the end of the movie, you know, like taking notes, like that would be, um, that would imply, you know, like some sort of comeuppance for the Stanton character. And I think that the reality is that she has to be there to sort of give the bona fides to, um, to Burton as, you know, someone who's like, with the cause someone who's you know who has left credentials who has you know a sort of radical past but uh, in sort of radical inclinations but ultimately to take that seriously on either her part or his part would be to um violate the kind of the fundamental ethic of the film which is to embrace this certain kind of you know pragmatic liberalism ultimately well, that, that kind of gets us back to the question we were we were pondering before about the end. Is it ambivalent or not? And I think we both agree that it is ambivalent, but I think maybe I find it more ambivalent than you because I I, I felt the end of the movie is not as good. I, I'm not I'm not equating in that sense, but I felt it as something akin to like the end of The Godfather, you know, where obviously what's happening is that Michael Corleone has triumphed. You know, he has beaten his enemies. He's the head of the family. They're kissing the ring and calling him Godfather. And his wife has believed his lie about not killing Carlo, et cetera, et cetera. He's gotten away with it. You know, he's won. He's at the top. But at the same time, the movie is quite clearly telling you, you know, he's fallen. In in his ascent, he has fallen. Uh, in his in his victory, he has lost, etc. He has he has gained the world and lost his soul. That sort of classic tragic story. Um, and I think this film is, I think it's getting at that. Like I think I I feel like Henry's decision because Henry decides to abandon Stanton and then Stanton talks him round. But you don't know, and then you get the. It's like um, you know, it's almost like a um. It's almost like a horror movie where it's sort of it's it's like the end of the Stepford Wives where you don't actually see what happens to Catherine Ross and then you get the sequence in the supermarket and then you know what happened you know that's that's what it's like at the end so right, it, um... it definitely has a queasiness for me you know um, I think the film is kind of saying yeah Henry went along he went along and they're all happy. Uh, because they won and it's all great, but he still did disobey what he knew to be right. I mean, I think the film goes, it, it's it's very problematic, especially now that I know that Henry is based on or sort of fulfills the narrative role of George Stephanopoulos, which is, that's just which, bizarre. Which even in 1998 but, was a complicated move, or even in 96 when the book was written, you know, like, yeah. you know, Joe Klein is not, you know whatever you have to say about joe klein as a reporter and you know like let's go look at old time magazine columns sometime and talk about joe klein as a reporter you know whatever you think like even in 1996 he had there, there was no question about who george stephanopoulos was and you know sort yeah. of like giving his role to like this kind of character was a deliberate move in terms of you know like uh, validating the clintons and validating you know bill in particular they're they're introducing this whole theme about like um 
black experience, you know, black civil yeah. rights and uh, American black politics, um, which is which is kind of not there in the reality. You know, by having this central character who is a a black man, and he and and I mean, one of the things I like about the movie, it, it is funny, um, is every t- you know he's being introduced around, and every time he meets a new white person, they all say something like, "Oh, I admired your granddaddy," or "I marched with yeah. your granddaddy," and he has to yeah. just sort of go, "Right, yeah, great." You know, I, I, mean, I thought that was very funny. Um, I mean, Susan. Susan Stanton, but, the Hillary Clinton stand-in, who I hope we talk about to at least some degree in this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time she meets him, she's like, I met you when you were eight years old or some something to this effect. You were in your underwear, jumping around in the sprinkler. And his response is like, oh, yes, thank you. I'm very happy to meet you, too. And it's like, I just, <laughs> I like, there's nothing in the performance, but I'm just like, fuck you just fuck you just that is not that is that is the way that you like diminish anyone and you you know like oh yeah i met you when you were eight years old you were dancing around in your tidy weddies in in a a sprinkler because you know like forget the fact that this is a like a wealthy white woman and a black man forget any forget any of that it's just like if someone said that to me um you know a I wasn't, (laughs) I mean, if someone, if someone were to like play that game, it's like, oh yeah, I know the power play we're doing here. And if I have to eat shit for a while in order to get in the good graces, that's fine. But this is not treated in any way. And and I read that sequence in the book and there's no context, even in the book, that this is, you know, a problematic thing for anyone to say, but like, yeah, it happens in the book then. Yeah. Yeah. So but it does it, it does feel very racially charged to me it feels like you know the the lady of the of the of the plantation you know uh, the 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 young black man comes around asking if there's work you know and she says oh i remember you when you were just a baby because he was her maid's kid or something like that that's what yeah. it felt like it yeah. felt very uh, plantation you know very uncomfortably and i'm not sure that emma thompson is is aware of this in and uh, like emma thompson is sort of playing this character as just very straight and there were multiple she times she feels in the very movie. like second wave feminist in terms of playing this i think that it's i mean god should we talk about stanton should we talk about emma thompson in this i i feel like this is probably slightly well, out yeah, of our I, wheelhouse in terms of like discussing um you know various like feminisms etc but like this feels very i, want to. I just want to i just want to finish my thought about the introduction of the sort of the the, the black white dynamic because I was very uncomfortable at times watching this, particularly with the subplot about the the um, the young girl that stands. I mean, I mean, apart from the fact that we're talking about him having raped a seventeen-year-old. Okay, that's 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 what happened here. It becomes established through the film that he had sex with a seventeen-year-old, um, and that apparently, you know, like again, this is another thing we need to talk about. Libby, the Kathy Bates character, who's kind yeah. of the conscience of the film. She is apparently, she can cope with that, but her big breaking point where she realizes that these people have sold out, you know, that breaks her heart to the point where she kills herself is they're prepared to be mean about a white guy, you know, raping the 17 <laughs> year old black girl that I can encompass that I can get behind that I can put to one side, but being mean about Larry Hagman, that's not on, that's going to make me shoot myself, you know, <laughs> sure. that's and, and that the whole thing, <laughs> where this is being written by a white guy and you have this sort of black this story about a black guy who's selling out quote unquote his people to the point where he has to stop by the side of the road and vomit i just found the whole thing like this black crisis of conscience being written by white people about white people i just found the whole thing incredibly uncomfortable I, oh I no no say. absolutely abso- absolutely and and i mean there's a very deep kind of racial element in which we keep going back to that barbecue stand right you know which is, yeah. which is being run by this guy who you know is like you know like the politico show up here because this is like the best barbecue in arkansas or whatever right and um you know it's just this very oh my god like just so deeply uncomfortable in the sense that it doesn't give us a sense that fat willie um you know a he's called fat willie um yeah 
There's that. that fat Willie has his own like sort of political ambitions of his own that he might be kind of running this operation. This barbecue stand might be serving his interest in terms of serving a community of people who are not being served. You know, it's all about kind of, kind of like, well, this is just a campaign stop. This is a place where we show up or like even worse. This is something that has been like created by Stanton as this like Stanton's favorite place to go to eat ribs and fuck a 17 year old, you know, like, like that's at best, this is a failure of sort of political imagination. And at worst, this is just overt racism. And the fact that like, to my knowledge, there's no like place in Arkansas. And I, I may be wrong about this. I, I'm not like deeply invested in like this history to my knowledge. There's not like some rib shop that, you know, Bill Clinton would take people to in order to have like political conversations or something like that. There's no like story there, you know, um, and this doesn't exist in real life. This was invented for the film as a way of sort of like engendering, you know, Stanton slash Clinton's, you know, sort of like bona fides within the African-American community as a way of like establishing him as like the legitimate political choice. And then to tarnish him because, you know, he's doing naughty things with the girl, you know, ultimately, you know, and it's a way, but, but these, you know, um, you know, the, the people who are kind of being used here as political props never have any kind of real agency or have any kind of real like political ideology. There's no sense of like their place in the story and their places as people maneuvering. Um, and it's just, I mean, well, he, you know, again, the, really right is, here, it's you know, just, he's it's, depicted as kind of, he's depicted as kind of, you know, like a naive man child, you know, the scene yeah. where he goes and talks with uh, uh, Henry about the pregnancy and stuff. It's, it's played like he's just kind of this lumbering idiot. He, you know, he it's, almost again, shows up with like his hat in hand, you know, yes. he's like sitting there yes. and just kind of holding his hat and being like, I'm not going to do the no. kitchen accent. Like there's no, but <laughs> yeah, you know no. what I'm, you, yeah. well, Mr. Well, Mr. Stanton, you know, we, we must, uh, you know, I just want you to take care of my daughter. You know, under, you understand I'm not yeah. trying to you know, hurt your political career. I just want to make sure my daughter is taken care of, you, you know, sir. and, yeah. um, but you understand like where, you know, I'm sorry. I might've drifted into that slightly because, you know, there's no way to use that language and not, kind of go into that because that's it. i mean it's well, we're, <laughs> i'm not we're saying commenting it, on the fact that the film is indulging in those sorts of stereotypes that's exactly what we're saying, exactly yeah. the, the film the film is absolutely kind of using that as a thing and you know in any kind of real world portrayal of this kind of politics this he would be a kingmaker you know he would know exactly who ozio is he would be the one to call out like you know you know ozio's dad you know you know you know the dad is sitting there he's going to be the keynote speaker at that thing and you think you're the big shot but you're not and you know how i know that because uh everybody else came through this place too as a way of talking to you so you know go fuck yourself like this would be a committed political player yeah this yeah. trope keeps coming back as well. That this is in House of Cards, like the Kevin Spacey character in House of Cards. He has like a a, a black cook that he goes to to have like down home, straightforward conversations about life over ribs. It's ribs again. Ribs. I mean, and look, I grew up in the American South. I'm a white boy. I grew up in, the, but I grew up poor in the American South, right? Ribs are a thing. I'm not saying ribs aren't a thing, but barbecue, like barbecue, that's the real thing. Just saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, just got that. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. There's no way. There's no way in hell I'm cutting that, Daniel. That's. <laughs> <laughs> no i'm just saying like i grew up as a white boy in the south right you know and the this is such like new england liberal writing this shit too like yeah there's yeah. no understanding of like any kind of real dynamic here as to like what makes a really good barbecue restaurant ribs are great but ribs are ribs are easy frankly you know like i'm you know like you know 
it's you slow cook it you got a good dry rub it's fine like that's not that's not the really complicated shit it's the day in day out production of like pulled pork barbecue like that's that's the thing that actually makes your bread and butter and that's how you measure a great barbecue restaurant in my opinion. Yeah, that, that very well may be true, you know, but if you're a, if you're a liberal Democrat politician, a white liberal right. Democrat politician, if, the you, way if, you're in which bring, you, if you're bringing a New Yorker in, you give them the place that has the good ribs that you have the good contact with. But as a Southern boy, if if I were in that conversation, I'd be like, no, no, give me the pulled pork. Let me taste that. See, you're, That's how you see, I know. You're, yeah. you're making the mistake of thinking that this is about food. This isn't. This is about proving that you're a man of the people and right. that you understand, quote unquote, the black folks, etc., <laughs> right. et no, no. and the common people, etc. You know, you, you go and you get served ribs by the black guy that you know, yeah. that you're on first name terms with, although he calls you sir or Mr. Whatever. And you yeah. say, oh, these are the yeah. best damn yeah. ribs I've ever had. He Barney calls him or Willie or Benji Mr. or whatever. Mister yeah. is the yeah. yeah 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 yeah, and that's how that's how you know that you're one of the good ones. Yeah, is you eat you, and you then you eat, rape the, his you seventeen year old daughter, and, and then you rape his seventeen year old. <laughs> yeah, and then he comes to you hat in hand, just like just just provide for her, and they give him like two hundred thousand dollars or something, and it's like oh god, and it's it's disgusting. Again, disgusting, despicable behavior, you know, and then you know, the movie tells us explicitly, like, you know, like, no, I was not the father, but I faced the blood test. And so maybe I am the father. I don't know. It gets get complicated at the end in which, like, they just keep going back and forth about, like, how terrible is Jack Stanton actually supposed to be? You know, hmm. um, and this is where we haven't talked about the plot much because I don't like if people are interested in the movie, I would like to see them just like watch the movie and kind of get the plot. Like the plot is sort of like, there's some good stuff there. I think there's some good like movie making there, you know, but ultimately um, it's kind of not, not relevant to what we want to talk about. I think it's well made. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's very, I, mean, I feel like this is a theme on this show. I say this a lot, you know, it's very well made, but, and then I go into loads of complaining. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I feel like the things that were the things that have stood this test of time and enough for us to talk about them 20 years later are you know, obviously well made, you know, like that the, the complaint is not that it's not well made ultimately, you know, the complaint is that it's well made, but serving an agenda or serving an ideology or serving a worldview mm. that is you can kind of fundamentally fucked up and uh, that's a technical term we use in these kinds of studies i apologize if you didn't go to grad school um you know to understand what fucked up means but you know yeah it's very it's very much of its it's very much of its time as things can't help but being but you know that's not an excuse but you you get that you get you get the subplot about this woman cashmere who's obviously supposed to be a jennifer flowers analog you know and the film depicts her as the bimbo you know and this is yeah. this is a thing in the discourse around the quote unquote Clinton women, you know, um, the, the bimbo, the bimbo, um, you know, at the time it was omnipresent and people still talk like now, they talk like that. Now they're maybe a little bit more circumspect about it now, some people, but it's still a thing, you know, this sort of idea that, uh, these women, Paula Jones and Jennifer flowers and so on. Well, okay. Maybe Clinton did something or other, but you know, look at her. She's a bimbo. She's white trash, et cetera, et cetera. Monica Lewinsky. She's a bit fat. You know, you can, I mean, the, the irony of the Lewinsky thing is that it seems to be one of the more consensual relationships in Bill Clinton's yeah. catalog. It's, you know, I mean, he shouldn't have done it because there's a huge age and power differential between them. But she was, you know, she was consenting at least, you know, but um, yeah. no, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and he was definitely using her and definitely sort of lying to her about, oh, yeah. you know, what what he intended. But but also, yeah, like, I mean, I don't know, there was along, a very yeah. good podcast series. I, I may I may I might link it in the show notes here, but, you know, like that went through, you know, kind of 20 years later, kind of looking back at it in terms of like what we know now. And, you know, it seems like uh, Clinton had a real affection for her. Like this wasn't it wasn't just he was using her. It wasn't just he was lying. It was, you know, he's. I mean, look, he's president of the United States. He's the most powerful person in the world. Um, his wife is probably not fucking him very much for very obvious reasons. 
mm-hmm. if you know anything about them, you know, um, something that is sort of portrayed in the film. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a pretty 23 year old who shows up who is enamored with him. And it feels very like chaste in this weird way. Like there's no sense that he ever like, touched her or gave her any kind of physical like he never groped her he never did anything like this is not a defense like this is a this is a damnation to be clear um he was serviced he did not serve her you know like there was no consent i mean there was consent but there was no um a sense of uh reciprocality here you know in which he was also like going down on her it was like she was servicing him because he was the big man and she was the intern but also there was a real chat between them in this sort of like surreptitious almost teenagery way i mean it's, mm, she seems to have had a crush on him yeah no 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 and and and, and i think that was reciprocated i think that's what i kind of got from some of the reporting kind of again 20 years later is that they would they would like share notes with each other in which like he was like you know i really care about you too and like if i wasn't married etc you know and 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 it doesn't feel like this sort of like manipulative thing it feels like like this like schoolboy crush that he had on his intern sort of thing like Mm -hmm. and um that's the thing with talking about lewinsky in this context is that no one involved either with the book or the movie had any understanding of Lewinsky and how do we know that because the Lewinsky story dropped like six months after the movie was released and immediately made the movie completely irrelevant in terms of understanding Bill Clinton um, but also made the movie like a a fly in amber in terms of absolutely understanding the Bill Clinton presidency because suddenly you have this idea of who do we think Bill Clinton was before Monica Lewinsky is? And I feel like, you know, having read, and maybe this is is written by Joe Klein, et cetera, et cetera. And like, from my memories of that time and my memories of sort of the conversation around Bill Clinton from that time, it actually does sort of represent in some ways, sort of the political environment that Bill Clinton came into and sort of the promises of what like Bill Clinton might represent I think it's hard to remember that in 1992, the idea that the redneck governor from Arkansas was going to be president of the United States, like Republicans turned their attack guns on him, not just because he was a Democrat, they had had Democrat, uh, Democratic presidents previously, but because he was this like outside of the beltway outside of this sort of like mainstream and he had sort of like stumbled his way in and he brought in a bunch of people from sort of outside of those you know of that kind of harvard alumni sort of thing um and you know he 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 tripped mud all over the oval office basically you know he ate fast food he showed up in his like gym shorts and his t-shirts and a ball cap and he would sit in the oval office and like sign bills and this was just complete anathema to a oh yeah group. they they yeah. hated the clintons with with a yeah. fanatical like it's you and, know it's i mean you know there's and plenty for no of, good reason of, and for like well, for no good reason yeah please continue but for yeah, all no, the wrong like, reasons yeah for all the wrong reasons like there's yeah. plenty of dirt on all of the on, things on they hated Hillary. all the things they hated yeah. about will clinton those are the like yeah no i'm down with that yeah yeah. Show up yeah. in your but, t-shirt and jeans. You're president of the United States. You were rightfully elected. Sign the <laughs> fucking bills. Yeah. Yeah. And they pushed for they pushed for not something as great as Medicare for all, but better than you know, sort of Obamacare in 1993. If they had managed to get that passed, this world, certainly this country, but I think the world at large would be a better place by having some kind of like public health health infrastructure in the United States. You know, like they pushed for that really hard and got opposed I, at every turn. You know, like yeah. this is this and, was and good I, policy. I, I can hate the Clintons and acknowledge this is very good policy, you know, like I agree. I would also say that they helped the people who sabotage them by being exactly the kind of centrist, you know, compromising yeah. new Democrat types that they were, you know, they colluded in yeah. their, in the sabotage of their own best policies. Yeah. But the, 
yeah, they, they were they were hated and despised with a fanatical passion by the right, you know, and you ha- we have the whole sort of elves phenomenon, et cetera, et cetera, where, you know, Anne Coulter and, and, and all that sort of thing. But they were hated because they were um, boomers, you know, and because Hillary was yeah. intellectual and a woman with a career who wore trouser suits. And they were hated because, you know, Clinton had had uh, protested the Vietnam War because they'd been they'd been student, quote unquote, radicals because they'd been on the McGovern campaign. You know, the right had this idea that they, they were like, you know, pot smoking, hippie uh radicals that were going to you know and of course that's complete rubbish that, that you know that's complete nonsense <laughs> but the, the the right the right thought they were, they, well, were, I they mean, were we left saw it center. all over they again were, with obama they were they were well to do left of center democrats who you know got involved with some anti-war politics in the 60s you know and you know that's and and look respectable like, I mean, by itself respectable not gonna like look we don't we don't have to be purer than thou at that point yeah great good for you and then when they actually took political power they did so in a way that enabled the far right by triangulating everything there's this great moment in which bill clinton sorry uh uh, jack stanton is uh, (laughs) at a union hall and this is right after sort of the stories have dropped about uh, his uh, infidelities. And he, he has the crowd around his fucking finger. You know, he's telling jokes. They're like, you know, I mean, he, he's doing he's doing a perfect, you know, I'm a politician. I, I have the crowd wrapped around my, my finger kind of job, you know, exactly what's going on. And uh Somebody asked, you know, something like, well, "What are you going to do for us? You know, what are you going to do to get our jobs back?" And he's yeah, like, "Absolutely, like, key gonna, moment." Yeah, I'm going to tell you, and and this is in the con, and, and you can disagree with this, but in the conscious of the movie, this is meant to be Stanton being the perfect, like, like the the voice of the future, right? Um, and his answer is basically, "Here's the truth: no politician can reopen this factory." or bring back the shipyard jobs or make your union strong again. No politician can make it be the way it used to be because we're living in a new world now, a world without economic borders. A guy can push a button in New York and move a billion dollars to Tokyo in the blink of an eye. And in that world, muscle jobs go where muscle labor is cheap and that is not here. So if you want to compete, you're going to have to exercise a different set of muscles, the one between your ears. And then one of the like deep politicos you know um says you lost him and then our hero our hero henry burton says well he's got me and he actually says fuck them he's got me fuck him he's got me exactly exactly there is no better encapsulation of the last like 30 years of democratic politics in this country than that like it's perfect because it is intended completely unironically you see those poor people who work in a factory whose jobs are being lost they don't understand the value of the neoliberal economics which is now going to like crush them and like don't you want to be trained to use microsoft excel and work in an office instead of having a decent job in this factory you know for, um, for a while before all those jobs are shifted right. shipped abroad as well and, and of course and of course like not to be not to you know kind of take like kind of basic labor and say like yeah well we shouldn't use uh, mechanical implements to like remove people's need for labor but like ultimately this is sort of the the failure of this kind of electoralism in general and the failure of bourgeois politics uh, in particular you know um which jack i'm sure jack could speak to much more eloquent than i can, uh, eloquently than i can but like i feel like we should at least highlight that like it's not that we think that these people should be you know like given to like working in whatever like it's like a fish processing plant or something you know and like yes getting the insides of dead fish that's not like a great life for people you know working on an industrial scale no that's bad yeah having machines to do that that's actually a good thing um but there's nothing within like uh, anything like an american political system that actually acknowledges that like maybe these people deserve some recompense for that and there was a place for that there isn't there is a logic to 
at that point, at the beginning of this kind of neoliberal era, to reject this kind of Reaganist neoliberal policy and to say, like, no, actually, we're going to engage in something more like a social democratic process. We're going to take these unions and we're going to engage with them. And instead, what they did was they reached out to um, the suburbs because, like, we're going to triangulate every position. And ultimately, yeah. um, these people who work in these factories, they are um, they're minuscule. Like this, we don't care about them. We would much rather have, uh, we'd much rather try to uh, appeal to Republicans who might vote for us in uh, in the suburbs uh, in the next cycle. And it was very successful for like eight years (laughs) and they're still doing it. And Joe Biden's approval ratings are 25% because they're still pursuing it. So like that's, yeah. Yeah. That's the key, isn't it? It was successful for Clinton for eight years. You know, um, sorry, factory workers, but neoliberalism, fuck off. Oh, yeah. sub- suburban middle classes. Um, yeah, we're going to punish the people below you. The welfare queens come to us. That worked for eight years, but it worked for eight years for Clinton because through basically very little to do with him, uh, the economy was really good because the global economy was was you know really good I mean, really good is relative you know but yeah it turns it's not working for biden now because the global economy is on a downswing it, it turns out that being president when like silicon was becoming a thing that was becoming accessible to the masses uh, mostly mm-hmm. because of uh, two decades on from uh vast government infrastructure spending yeah on um you know internet <laughs> on you know like TCPIP and various uh, technologies that became the internet. It turns out that being president in that era means that you uh, sit on the on the crest of a booming economy. Isn't that phenomenal for you? And yeah. when you're when you're when certain firms anyway are reaping the profit benefits from the the Reaganite deregulation orgy, and when the former communist world is being cannibalized by Western countries <laughs> uh, companies, sure. yeah, yeah, etc. Um, yeah. The, Absolutely. That is the only bit of real material politics he ever gives right. It gives voice to in the entire film. And it amounts to, yeah, neoliberalism is just a fact of life. It it, it can't be changed. It can't be resisted. Um, uh, you know, he, what he doesn't tell them the truth because he doesn't tell them why it's happening. He doesn't tell them that it's a conscious choice on the part of governments in response to uh, declining and stagnating profit rates to deregulate, break union power, free up money to, to to go wherever you want, et cetera, et cetera, all these neo- neoliberal policies, which is why their jobs are disappearing, uh, either just disappearing completely or being moved into new sectors abroad or in different sectors. You know, he, do- he doesn't he doesn't actually tell them the truth. What he says, what is what he says effectively is shit happens um, and you've got to deal with it. And th- that is and. The film, I mean, I agree with you on this one completely. I think we differ on the ending, but on this one, I agree completely. The film is just completely straight faced about this. The film does not get any of the ironies here at all because it just has Henry like, you know, th- these these dinosaur sort of union factory workers are kind of, Ugh. but Henry is the is the man of conscience, the politically educated guy, the, the yeah. guy who's serious about real p- policies that are actually going to help people in the difficult modern world. And he's nodding along. And that is where the film, that is where the film's sympathies lie, I think. Yeah. No, and no. Where the film these... has a problem with the Clinton project, it's all to do with personal morality. Yeah. And as I've, as I've pointed out, and it's like, not even actually... Should we, should we do negative ads? Turns out to be like yeah. the last half yeah. of the movie. You know? Well, like, as I say, it's not even the, the aspects of personal morality that really matter, like, you know, raping teenagers. It's the, should I be mean to the old white senator guy, you know? Yeah. Picker. Picker, who we learn, yeah. we're not going to get into this, but, you know, was like the previous generations like he was the the former like bright star that all of these people worked under until like stanton and uh, the kathy bates character uh you know sort of worked under him and then like kind of became came into their own political reality and so like going against him is like going against their own like previous you know belief structure their kind of previous you know like ideology or their ideals or their you know but ultimately there's no like political reality to him to have man's character to pick her it's ultimately a um a story of he has really good political instincts and again like it's hard to not like read this as just this sort of like 
indictment 20 years later, 24 years later. Uh, yeah. 24 years later of the, um, of that kind of DNC DLC, like, like instinct of, well, you know, who, you know, you, the greatest politician is the one that connects with the people that sort of yeah. says the right things and has the right talking points, regardless of the reality of the policies and that, you know, winning elections is all that matters, you know, um, because yeah. we're not the Republicans, we're not the Republicans. And um, yeah. I feel like we can't, um, <laughs> We can't end this without referring to the recent interview with Hillary Clinton in the Financial Times. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> Have you seen I'm it? not. No, I know about it, but I haven't looked at it. Yeah, I'm not um, actually an avid follower of the uh, of the remarks of Hillary Clinton, believe it or not, <laughs> or, or or presumably of the Financial Times. I would assume that you're not like a regular reader. Well, this uh, came up in my uh, Twitter feed on. Uh, you know, many, many occasions. Um, I'm reading from a link from the Financial Times. Um, the first voice we hear is like the, the authorial voice of the author. My espresso has arrived. Clinton asked for more iced tea. <laughs> is that actually the first line? It's not the first line of the article, but, you know, of, of our segment here, of our like sentence here, you know. Okay, all right. then. I cannot allow the lunch to end without questioning the direction of her party. And just to be clear, uh, the author has, like I said, on numerous occasions that their goal is to get something out of Hillary Clinton that other interviewers haven't, to ingratiate themselves, to actually get something out of this, like, famously stonewalled politician, which, and mm -hmm. again, let's, let's be clear, um, Hillary Clinton has been attacked in the media, uh, the right-wing media, you know, mm -hmm. to an astonishing degree, like, yeah. She does yeah. not. She does not say any word that is not like pre-calculated on five hundred different levels. I don't blame her for that specifically. Like, yeah. I would do that too in her position. Again, this is attacking Hillary Clinton for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> you know, like the yeah. things to admire him being Clinton's plenty of right reasons, but <laughs> these are the yeah. wrong ones. Yeah. The reason to I can admire Hillary Clinton in terms of her like fortitude, in terms of like you know holding fast against these far right assholes, and also say like you also enabled the far right assholes in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, but in more subtle ways, and also you. Uh, had slaves uh in your uh arkansas mansion uh anyway mm -hmm. just saying that and, here uh, libya yeah. and honduras and drone strikes etc yes. etc et yeah. et all, et all, yes. all the other things yes um links in the show notes i'm sure and back to the article i say that democrats seem to be going out of their way to lose elections by whole, elevating activist causes comma Notably, the transgender debate, comma, mm -hmm. which are relevant only to a small minority, period. Wow, I didn't see that coming. What sense does it make to depict J.K. Rowling as a fascist? Question mark. To my surprise, to my surprise, Clinton shares the premise of my question. Uh journalist at the Financial Times is shocked that Hillary Clinton shares the premise of the question that they asked. I am also shocked, as you can tell. Yeah. Hillary Clinton responds, we are standing on the precipice of losing our democracy and everything that everyone else cares about then goes out the window, she says. Look, the most important thing is to win the next election. The alternative is so frightening that whatever does not help you win should not be a priority. Now, this has been kind of widely retweeted as Hillary Clinton said that like fighting for trans rights is against um, is a bad thing to do. Technically, what the article does is state an authorial voice 
that transgender debate, which are relevant only to a small minority, and then asks Clinton to respond to that. So we don't know the exact statement that Hillary Clinton might have made. And we so I cannot say specifically based on this context that Hillary Clinton hates trans people or thinks that trans people should not have rights, et cetera, et cetera. But based on the framing of this question, if we treat this as a realistic um, treatment of an actual conversation, in other words, if we treat this financial times reporter as being uh, in any way legitimate as a reporter, this is Hillary Clinton literally saying, I'm going to throw trans people under the bus in terms of getting more Democrats elected because uh, ultimately it's better than the Republicans. And it doesn't matter ultimately uh, how many trans people we have to burn uh, because ultimately the Republicans are worse. In other words, Hillary Clinton in like a week ago in 2022 is expressing the exact attitude that the film 1998 and the book in 1996 and the whole logic of the 1992 campaign, the whole new left Democrat thing we're saying nothing has changed. Nothing at all has changed in terms of this perspective. Yeah. And if there is any more damning indictment of the Clintons, even above their actual crimes <laughs> and their actual, like all the things that like Jack King catalog for us and exquisite detail in which I could do in less exquisite, but also like fairly good detail. The fact that they are still pursuing this and the fact that this is the standard line of the democratic party is that, well, you just have to win elections because ultimately winning elections is what matters because we're better than the Republicans. And it doesn't matter that Roe v. Wade is going to be crushed probably by the time you listen to this episode. It doesn't matter that, you know, we have lost for 30 years. It doesn't matter because ultimately we're better than the Republicans. And um, maybe even if we're looking within the realm of electoral politics, there is a better way of doing things. And also if this is the limit of where electoral politics are going in the United States, maybe just maybe we need to look beyond the context of electoral politics. Well, no, I, I think you're completely wrong, Daniel, because uh, I watched this brilliant movie called Primary Colors, and it made it clear that the only other alternative to just accepting all this reality, you know, just these these sort of Democrat policies that, that accept the real world as you find it, i.e., you know, fucked up by Republicans, is to just accept all that and get elected and not change it. In fact, to make it worse, slightly slower, so that the Republicans can then take it over eventually and go, you know, go into overdrive again, so that in in another few years, you can say, well, you've got to vote for us because otherwise it's the Republicans. And once we get in, we'll just accept everything they've been doing as the new normal and go back to making it slightly better or well, actually worse, more slowly. You know, we just accept that round delay. That's the only, the only other alternative to that is to say, oh, um, we, we used to be like idealistic young McGovernites, uh, but but what's happened to us? You know, we 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 can't even keep a crumb of our idealism to the point where we'll play the game, the, the essential game, the essential game that we all accept, the game of electoral politics. We'll play that slightly nicer than the other side. We can't even do that. Oh well, I better go and kill myself. That's to me. Those yeah. are the only. Those are the only horizons. Just vote Democrat forever and hope you know that they don't. It gets worse slightly, slowly for a few years at a time, or uh, suicide. That's. I think that's. I think the movie makes that clear. Yeah, no, clearly. Um, actually, <laughs> uh, Picker being like a man who had a bunch of uh, coke fueled gay sex in the 80s um, in Florida with a bunch of Cuban men. Actually, I'm more likely to vote for him. Yes. Like <laughs> Picker 2024. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> probably has a uh, broader context for certain things that uh, anyone in electoral politics in our country uh, right now. So, um, yeah. 
<laughs> there's so much more we could do on this movie i feel like we say this yeah. at every time like we're like yeah let's just talk about a movie it's gonna be goofy and fun and then we do like an hour and a half and it's like we could do four hours um but uh, uh not well, we will not, insist upon picking these mo- these sorts of movies won't we you know we yeah, yeah. let's find interesting movies although i feel like you and i could do like you know just pick a movie out of a hat let's do toy story 2 yeah, we could fill four hours in terms of like well, what Toy Story Two has to say about Star Wars and the uh, history of <laughs> you know commodification of like toy companies in the nineteen seventies through the nineties. I was, was going to say you picked a film that's literally about commodity fetishism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just picked it out of my head, but you know what I mean. You know, like yeah. you're talking to the guy that castrated Buzz Lightyear in the name of Marxism. So you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> anyway, um, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about before we uh, wrap up here? No. We, I, I mean, as you say, we could talk a lot more about this. This is a this is a uh, an interesting film, but um, yeah, I think I think we've talked long enough about this one. Do so, you think um, Do you think people should watch this? Just I mean, just like we do on, actually. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. because I, I, it I made me it made me have thoughts and feel feelings. You know, I'm very ambivalent about it. I but uh, yeah, it, it definitely sparked thoughts. You know, I think yeah. ultimately this film is a kind of rather disgusting sort of, um, you know, ex hippie or ex uh, 60s radical sort of boomer lefty it's, it's um, very it's very like strict off the boomers like that's what this is yeah <laughs> it, it's it's this it's this rather sort of uh, lament about oh you know we used to be so young and idealistic but what's happened to us but you know maybe we can salvage something but isn't it tragic that you know and it's particularly disgusting because it's sort of told through this 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 surface veneer of being about sort of black experience, you know, through this black character who I learn is literally like a sort of puppet avatar for somebody who was actually, who's actually a white guy, which makes it so much worse. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is interesting. I will give it that. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I mean, it's well made. We've talked about that a couple of times. I, you know, I, I again, really, really enjoyed it when I was in my early 20s, when it was kind of like fairly fresh at the time. Um, It has not aged well, but I think it, um, you know, particularly if you view it outside of, uh, you know, what we're doing in this conversation, if you just kind of view it as like a film on its own merits, I think it is sort of doing some interesting things. And it is, again, very well made. Um, And I think it's also interesting as this kind of like time capsule of this era. And I think that's, Mm -hmm. that's really how I want people to approach it as, you know, in the same way that you would approach, you know, some weird political thriller of the 70s and kind of go like, well, yeah, but at the time, dot 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 um you do have to kind of approach this well at the time dot 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 and um i think that's uh you know this is not the last you know the last story in this but i think it um it is a a piece of people and i think it should be more widely viewed and studied ultimately so check it out Okay, well, that was bonus episode 17 did you say yeah Uh, i don't i don't know 17 i think probably something like that anyway yeah and uh thanks ever so much for being here on this side of the paywall and, and to, if it is to listen to it, it and if it is 17 it's a prime number so this is a primary color whoa <laughs> you brought it home fantastic okay that's enough goodbye goodbye and that is pretty much where daniel and i stopped talking about the movie Uh, and therefore, as far as we were concerned, in the moment, stopped doing a bonus episode for Patreon backers. But we kept on talking, and here's some of the rest of our conversation. Yeah, no, I had a a moment the other day, I was watching some of the uh, American news uh, coverage of the January 6th hearings, you know, the the committee hearings. And um, I can't remember who it was. It was somebody like Chris Hayes or somebody like that, you know, commenting on it. And uh, it was just kind of on, you know, it drifts from the coverage yeah. to the opinion piece and so on. And, uh, you know, Chris, Chris Hayes is all right as far as he goes. I mean, and he's, um, he's you know, a very he's, nice he's showing... progressive liberal, you know? Yeah. 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 He, he was talked, very you know, nice he a lot in of like sense on 2011. He was very nice in yeah. 2011. Yeah. But it's like, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, they're just nothing else at the moment, but the January 6th hearings. And it's clear. I mean, 
I, I don't want to I don't want to downplay the importance of getting to the bottom of what went on inside the White House and the, the Trump organization, et cetera, and their connections with the coup and all that. I think that's important. You know, a lot of people on the left yeah. are just like, you know, that's not important. It's just lib stuff. Just ignore it. I don't agree with that. I think it is important. But it's also the only thing they're fucking talking about, you know, and it's clear yeah. the Democrats have this attitude attitude to it like it's a truth and reconciliation committee you know like we just we just make our nice little speeches and uh, that'll that'll make trumpism go away because there are the, the the honorable republicans like rusty bowers you know etc cetera, etc cetera, who said after his testimony you know oh, i'll vote for trump again but you know th- this one report you know hayes is talking about and you know they cut to like footage from the january 6th riot and there's nick fuentes standing on that uh, yeah whatever it was with his with his megaphone shouting yeah. and i'm I'm like, tell them who that is, Chris. Tell them about him. Tell them about Nick Fuentes. Tell them Chris about, about Chris Hayes. No. Chris Hayes has no. no Chris Hayes has no like ability to talk about Nick Fuentes no, because he doesn't to know. talk about Nick Fuentes. Well, a he doesn't know. I mean, someone on his staff probably knows. I mean, you know, I'll I'll give them that. Like, there's so, you know, there's a researcher back there who at least has like some vague understanding. It's not hard to Google Nick Fuentes and reach like pieces from the SPLC and various other places that would tell you who Nick Fuentes is. Um, but within the framework of a four minute segment in on a cable TV network in terms of its planning. Well, Nick Fuentes is someone who, you know, is a, a splinter group from the alt-right who created this Groper movement, which is uh, in part of a, uh, you know, a reactionary element against the more, uh, you know, <laughs> relatively uh, progressive parts of the Republican party. And, by the relatively progressive parts of the Republican Party, I mean Charlie Kirk, which should tell you everything you need to know. Um, like in terms of like exploring, like this is something that these guys are really bad at in terms of like really kind of getting into the nuances of, you know, like the the, the nuances of right wing politics or even like Republican politics, in which everything gets flattened into. You know, you're either with Trump or against Trump because Trump is the big bad, right? Trump and is it. yeah, you know, I see Trump. I mean, frankly, I see Trump as basically irrelevant. Like, even if he's president in 2024, I see him as kind of irrelevant to the kind of larger forces that you know that we talk about. You know, like of course he will do terrible things because he will appoint terrible people who are you know fed and fed by the Federalist Society. You know, but that's the Federalist Society has sort of set him up and he just has the the moxie to kind of come in and be the new guy, you know, ultimately. I mean, he's he's again, he's he's a symptom, not a cause. And that's and the further away from 2016 we get, the more obvious it is that Trump is not like Trump. Trump is the catalyst. Trump is not like the real mover behind this, you know, Um and I feel like that focusing on him is like sort of the, the the original sin of these like cable networks and these the liberals is like, well, if we just get rid of Trump, then it's done. And so anyone yeah. who's against yeah. Trump, and that means Sam Harris is good. That means <laughs> you know the never Trumpers. That means Rick Wilson and Bill Crystal. <laughs> yeah, these are perfectly fine people because they're anti-Trump. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Liz they, they, Cheney. They, they, Liz they, Cheney is fine. Mitt yeah. Romney. These are good people now because they're anti-Trump. They're George W. Over, Bush. George W. Bush. Yeah. Not as bad as Trump yeah. because they're fawning over the Bill Barr. Things. They're yeah. fawning over yeah. yeah Mike Pence. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No. And that's and it's a complete lack of like any kind of material analysis. And yeah. you don't even need like a real material analysis. You just need to have like memory past fifteen minutes ago to to get this what they and- what they what they want you know the democratic party and the all the sort of liberal progressive news hosts this meet this section of the media what they want is for you know just the republican party to suddenly go oh right now i get it now trump's bad okay okay so we get rid of him and uh, a couple of other people and we get back to normal 
That's it's clear that that's what they want, you know. And they yeah. think if they just make this point over and over again, Trump knew this and he said that, and they think that's going to. But what you know, as you say, Trump is an expression of a tendency within the system, and you can see that with the testimony at the committee. Because what you see again and again is that Trump doesn't actually have a fucking clue what's going on. Trump is a great big toddler at the center of this who's just stamping his foot, saying, "I won." I want to be the president. I want to win. And what's the terrifying thing is that there's people around him. And we're not just talking about Stephen Miller and people like that. We're talking about, you know, like people who are just normal parts of the functioning of this government system who are doing like Kershaw talks about with Hitler working towards the Fuhrer. They're coming up with this stuff themselves to work towards what the leader wants. You know, the leader wants to still be president. Well, what we do is we come up with a strategy where we send this letter from the Department of Justice to the, you know, the, the system has this tendency within it already. He's just, as you say, he's just catalyzing it. And part of that is the presence of people, you know, it's not just telling people who Nick Fuentes is. It's telling people this guy, this guy, this guy there on screen, who's at the January 6th protests, screeching and screaming through a megaphone. He just had a conference and Marjorie Taylor Greene was there. Paul Gosar was at one of his previous company uh, conferences. He's got documented links to people inside the Republican Party. You know, they, they, they're just missing this. They're missing how it joins up in favor of this oh, well, we've got Trump now because we've got some guy who says, oh, I told him you didn't win. And it's like, how could, how can you possibly miss the point this battle? Well, is it there material conditions to do so? Yeah, well, that's, that's how ultimately. And I mean, and just thinking about Roe v. Wade, I mean, sorry, different thing, but I think I'm going to connect this up here. Um, what happened when the leaked uh, decision happened? Uh, every Democratic politician, every like the DNC, you know, suddenly start sending out fundraising emails. You know, donate, vote for us. Like it's good for yeah. them. Like, it's good for them. It's good for them yeah. to have a Trump there to point against to say we're not Trump. It's good for them to have. If Roe v. Wade ends, they're going to campaign for thirty years. You know, keep voting for us. Keep giving us money. Keep doing the thing. Um, so that we can eventually, you know, put in enough justices or we can do the thing and, you know, we can It's going to flip over the Republicans used for 30 years. They used, you know, if we get in, we'll work against abortion. And then they, they get in time and time again, and they never actually get rid of abortion because they want to use it next time as the wedge issue again, yeah. it's going to flip over so that, you know, Roe v. Wade gets appealed and it'll be the Democrats turn for three decades to say, you've got to vote for us so that we can work on getting abortion by this this well, system is just the a republicans seesaw. the difference is that the republicans had like a they had a very coherent political movement from the end of the 70s that was built on you know building the sort of like structural framework within the system to to do this you know to repeal this and repeal like everything that came about from the warring court. And there's nothing that I see on the democratic side in which there's like a real, like kind of effort at like a structural thing that's going to do anything on that scale. Instead, what we're hearing from even the, you know, even the sort of like, even like an AOC is kind of doing like green new deal, which like, yeah, that's a great, well, it's problematic and, you know, it has details and implementation, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, no, great. Yeah. Let's do the green new deal. Let's do some version mm -hmm. of the green new deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a 30 year plan for a 10 year, you know, time horizon, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. and uh, <laughs> you know, you have no hope of actually planning that and you have no like structural thing because ultimately, you know, you're a 28 year old bartender from the Bronx. Yeah, you know, you don't have institutional money behind like building a think tank that's going to give like white papers that are going to defend your policies that like every person on MSNBC is going to be able to pull out and yeah, yeah which is exactly what the Republicans did. You know, like, and, and not to say that the Democrats should do what the Republicans did, but you know, there's no sense of like there being like a vision for the Supreme Court or whatever, you know, beyond, well, this should be a nonpartisan, like sort of legal structure. And it's like, no, 
fuck you. Legal realism is the thing that we need to embrace. And we are embracing a fully progressive vision because ultimately that's uh, what we need to do. And this is a political body. This is a fundamentally political body and fuck you. If you think it's not, and um, that's what I would like to see. And no one in the Democratic Party or in any of the like major democratic institutions is doing anything of that sort. And we're fucked. We're just fucked. Like it's done. It's been done. The second that Gorsuch gets, the second that Donald Trump was elected, it was done. But like Amy Coney, Coney Barrett, Diane Feinstein hugged her hugged her at the end of those confirmation hearings and like if there was ever a like a symbol of the failure of the democratic party and of the shit that's in primary colors that whole like structure of argument that's in that's it it is that it that that was the end result of bill clinton being president and that like style of politics it's despicable it's fucking despicable That was I Don't Speak German. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show or found it useful, please spread the word. If you want to contact me, I'm at underscore Jack underscore Graham underscore. Daniel is at Daniel E. Harper. And the show's Twitter is at IDSGPod. If you want to help us make the show and stay 100% editorially independent, we both have Patreons. I Don't Speak German is hosted at I Don't Speak German dot com. And we're also on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and we show up in all podcast apps. This show is associated with Erudatorum Press, where you can find more details about it. The music was by Loon the Band. 